thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. I'm uh, delighted uh, to be here and have a chance to uh, speak with you tonight about uh, Harry Truman. Uh, I first came to the uh, meeting, to a meeting of the Royal Asiatic Society uh, back at somewhere in probably in February or March of 1970, shortly after I arrived in Korea as a Peace Corps volunteer. And uh, at that time, the uh, meetings of the Royal Asiatic Society were very popular with Peace Corps volunteers because the meetings were held at the Swedish Medical Center, and they were preceded by a big buffet <laughs> that was a very low-cost uh, event and had uh, excellent uh, Western food. And for many of the volunteers who lived down the countryside at those days, uh, they hadn't had, uh, I lived in Seoul, so it wasn't that much of a problem for me, but down country they had not had uh, any food that tasted like home in maybe a month or so. So it was, it was a good place for us to meet other Peace Corps volunteers who would come up for the banquet. Uh, unfortunately for many of them, many of them after the banquet was over, they snuck out and did not go to the lecture. Uh, so, I'm, I'm gratified tonight, to, you know, that some years ago they did away with the, with the big banquet. I don't know when that happened. But I know that you're not here for the food. <laughs> so that's uh, kind of gratifying to me. Um, uh, also, shortly after I arrived in Korea, let's, uh, uh, I visited uh, Incheon. And uh, I was anxious to see Incheon. I, I, been a history major in college, and I, by the time I entered the Peace Corps, I already had my master's degree. I knew quite a bit about the history of the Korean War, you know, for someone with a master's degree. And I, I was curious about Incheon. I wanted to see the site of this famous battle and the landing where uh, MacArthur's forces had uh, come ashore in uh, September of uh, 1950 and uh, enjoyed this great victory that. Uh, at least for a time, turned around the course of the Korean War. And I wanted to see where the tides came in and the big walls and everything. I, I persuaded some students to take me to Incheon. At that time, you had to go by train. There was, you just couldn't get there on a road. And uh, of course, it was a much different kind of town 40 years ago than it is today. But one thing that remains the same is the statue of Douglas MacArthur uh, overlooking the bay in Incheon. And, now it's in a very attractive park. And at that time in, in 1970, I told my students that that was certainly a very impressive statue of General Douglas MacArthur. But there should also be a statue up there of Harry Truman, the President of the United States. And my students said, oh no, no, no. Truman was bad. Uh, <laughs> Truman, Truman fired MacArthur. And if Truman hadn't fired MacArthur, Korea would be unified today. And I said, well, I wasn't really sure about that, but I said, one thing you can be sure of, Harry Truman was MacArthur's commander in chief. And if Harry Truman hadn't made the decision in June of 1950 to send MacArthur and UN forces to Korea, Korea would certainly be unified today, but it would be unified under the fellows from the North. No, no, they said that's not the way it would have been. You know, MacArthur was a great general and Truman was, was bad. Well, I, I, I'm not here necessarily to convert you to uh, Trumanism tonight, but I would like to talk a little bit about the critical decisions that Truman made and, and why he made them and some of the implications of these decisions over the years. In, uh, on the afternoon of uh, uh, June 25th, uh, 1950, Harry Truman uh, was uh, visiting his home in Independence, Missouri. Uh, earlier that day, he had been in Baltimore where he was involved in the dedication of the new Baltimore uh, Friendship Airport. And then he flew out to Independence, uh, had a, a late dinner, uh, with his wife Bess and his daughter Margaret and was doing some reading in his study about 
9.30 at night when the quiet of his home in Independence was interrupted by the sharp ringing of the telephone. And on the other end of the line was his Secretary of State, Dean Atchison. Mr. President, we have a serious problem, Secretary of State Atchison said. The North Koreans have invaded South Korea. So immediately, Truman made the first critical decision that he would make during the Korean War. He told Atchison to seek a special meeting of the Security Council of the United Nations for the following day, which in the United States it would have been Sunday, uh, and to um, uh, uh, seek a resolution uh, denouncing the attack and uh, uh, offering support uh, to the people of South Korea. Within the next two years, President Truman would make a series of momentous decisions related to Korea that would change the course of American, East Asian, and world history. Well, who was Harry Truman, anyway? Uh, for those of you who are not, not uh, familiar with the biography of our 33rd president, he was born in a little town in southwest Missouri called Lamar, uh, the eldest of three children. Uh, he was born in 1884. His family left Lamar when Truman was seven and moved to the uh, city of Independence, Missouri, a city about, at that time, about 10 miles east of Kansas City. Now Independence is all engulfed in the suburban sprawl of the Kansas City area. It has 150,000 people and it's the fourth largest city in Missouri. But at that time, it only had about 5,000 residents. It was the county seat of Jackson County and was noted for its good schools. And Truman's mother, who was uh, a college graduate, uh, unusual for those days, uh, was very concerned about her children's education, particularly her eldest son, Harry, who uh, seemed to have a scholarly inclination and uh, was prohibited from playing uh, rough sports like baseball and football because at an early age, at about six years of age, he began wearing glasses. Uh, he was nearsighted and uh, they didn't have safety glasses in those days, and so it was great concern that a ball or something might hit him in the eye. So he did a lot of reading and learned to play the piano as a young man. Uh, his family later moved to a farm just outside of Independence that Harry Truman, after graduating from uh, high school, managed for about 10 years. Uh, Truman wanted to make something of himself. He wanted to go to college. His family didn't have the money. Uh, he was the only American president of the 20th century not to have attended. Uh, well, he, had, he went to some night school, but he did not graduate from a college or university. Uh, incidentally, uh, two of our other greatest presidents uh, never attended uh, a college or university, had no higher education. Uh, Lincoln and Washington. So I don't know what this says about the value of higher education <laughs> and leadership, but uh, you have to draw your own uh, conclusions there. Um, uh, he he uh, wanted to go to West Point. He passed the written exam, but again, because of bad eyesight, he wasn't able to attend West Point. But he did join the Missouri National Guard, served as an artillery captain in the First World War. Upon returning from the war, he married his grade school and high school sweetheart, Bess Wallace, uh, and he opened a small business in downtown Kansas City, uh, a notorious haberdashery or men's clothing furnishing store, which uh, famously failed after one and a half years. He then entered politics. Good career move to fail in business. He even went to politics. He, he had been an active Democrat throughout his life. His father was prominent in local uh, politics. Uh, he was part of the Democratic political machine run by a boss named Tom Pendergast. After 10 years in county government, he won statewide election to serve as the United States Senator from Missouri, re-elected in 1940, and then in 1944 was chosen by the party regulars to be the, the compromise candidate to run with Franklin Roosevelt uh, when Roosevelt sought his fourth term as president in 1944. After 82 days as Roosevelt's vice president, Truman found himself 
President of the United States in the midst of the greatest war in the history of the world. During his administration, uh, Truman made critical decisions on how the Second World War should be ended, including the decision to authorize the military to use atomic bombs against Japan. He was responsible for leading the United States into the United Nations. Roosevelt had set that course. Truman followed through on it. The Marshall Plan, the Truman Doctrine, the Berlin Airlift, the recognition of Israel, these were all some of the momentous international uh, events that took place during Truman's administration. In 1948, he won, real, he won election in his own right, defeating the governor of New York, Thomas Dewey, in a, a surprise uh, victory, uh, proclaimed uh, a fair deal, uh, domestic economic policy to spread the New Deal more widely, and then uh, uh, also in, in the area of civil rights, uh, uh, desegregated the federal bureaucracy and the, uh, and the United States uh, military with an executive order when Congress refused to act. So he had a very active presidency prior to the, the Korean War. <laughs> President Truman would frequently state that his decision to send American troops to Korea under the UN command to resist the invasion of the North Koreans was the most difficult decision he ever made. He knew when he made this decision that he would be sending American soldiers into a war from which they would not return. And indeed, 40, nearly 40,000 American soldiers lost their lives in the Korean War. But Truman made the decision very quickly in spite of his difficulties. Meet at the Blair House in Washington, D.C. on the night of uh, June 26, 1950, uh, Truman made the decision that the attack on uh, South Korea was a critical test of American resolve to check the spread of Soviet communism. Truman believed the attack on South Korea might be a divisionary, a, a divisionary uh, diversionary, excuse me, a diversionary effort on the part of the Soviet Union uh, to take the American attention away from Europe and the Middle East. In fact, after this meeting that took place in the Blair House on, on Sunday night in the United States, uh, one of the aides uh, at that meeting, a young White House aide by the name of George Elsie, uh, was clearing up some of the papers and Elsie had been there taking notes. Elsie later went on to become Undersecretary Under of Defense during the Johnson administration and he was also um, head of the American Red Cross for over a decade uh, in the 1970s and early 80s. But at this point, Elsie was a young White House aide, and Truman called him over into the corner and said, George, look at this. And he had this big globe, and Truman pointed to the globe and said, this is what the Soviets are really after. And he pointed to the globe, and he was pointing to Iran. He believed the Soviets were ready to make some move in the Middle East to secure the, the oil supplies that were there. But he was also concerned that the Soviets were anxious to get the United States bogged down in a, in a land war in, uh, uh, in Asia and thereby uh, weaken, uh, weaken NATO. Truman was also uh, uh, a firm believer in the United Nations. Uh, he had supported the United Nations as a member of the United States Senate, as Vice President, and as president, the United Nations Charter was signed during his second full month as president of the United States. And Truman believed that the attack on South Korea, or the Republic of Korea, a republic that had been created two years earlier, that attack was really an attack on the United Nations and the viability and credibility of the United Nations. Uh, Truman felt, and this is a man who was a served in the First World War and as was a Wilsonian Democrat, that Truman believed that, that World War II came about in large part because the League of Nations had been weak and the League of Nations could not respond to the uh, Soviet, or to, to the advances of, of uh, the Japanese militarists, uh, the fascists in Italy, the Nazis in Germany, and that the United Nations would suffer the same fate 
as the League of Nations if strong uh, resistance to the Soviet-led uh, aggression uh, did not take place. Let me say something about what we do know of uh, Premier Stalin's uh, thinking at this time. Uh, Truman correctly, right from the beginning, as soon as he was told by Dean Acheson that the North Koreans had attacked South Korea, Truman said, it's the Soviets. The Soviets are behind this. And in spite of many uh, books uh, written by revisionist historians in the 60s and 70s, uh, questioning whether or not the South attacked the North first or whatever. It's clear from documents released from the Soviet archives that the Soviet Union, Joe Premier Stalin, had authorized the attack by North Korea, had supplied heavy tanks, uh, aircraft, advisors, even pilots for the aircraft uh, to support the attack. Stalin's motivations, we now know, uh, or his reasoning, uh, was that uh, the, the attack on South Korea by the North Koreans would be successful because the United States was not likely to intervene. Stalin miscalculated, but that was his thinking. His thinking was based on the fact that the United States uh, had made it clear it did not want to become involved in a land war in Asia. There were secret State Department documents that Premier Stalin had access to that had made this clear. He noted that the United States did not support Chiang Kai-shek uh, in, uh, in his final years uh, as president of, or leader of, of uh, the nationalists in China. And Stalin figured, well, if, if they're not going to support their longtime ally, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, they're not going to support, uh, other than that we did give them aid and military advisors 